So the recording of the uh, the meeting has, has started. I'm going to, uh, to cut the beginning. Uh, we're just going to go into black whiteboard mode. Yeah, this one. Um, <clears throat> Do you see the whiteboard? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Perfect. So um, we're going to start with a very brief introduction to uh, approximate Bayesian computing. Uh, there is actually a very great uh, article on Wikipedia, which was also published in Plus Computational Biology from a few years ago. They go through some of the theories, some of the pitfalls, um, some of the examples, uh, and it's, it's, it's well worth reading before you move into, um, into applications. So um, ABC, for, uh, it stands for Approximate uh, Bayesian Computation. And I thought I had bad on writing with a choke, and it's, it's even worse here. Uh, but the point is that you want, to, uh, you want to be fitting a model for which you have some parameters, but for which you do not necessarily have uh, an estimate of, uh, of the likelihood. It also works when you don't want to figure out what the likelihood uh, of this model should be. So let's say that you have something like um, a series of points, and you points. Uh, you sort of you suspect there might be some sort of a linear relationship between them, right? So it's of course not a problem we would solve necessarily with ABC, but we think that there would be a, a relationship between these points that would be linear in a sense. And so Y should be maybe A uh, times X plus B. So the question that we may we may be asking is what are the uh, what are the values of um, of these two parameters a um, and b and ABC is uh, it's uh, it's a Bayesian method because the first thing we need to we need to do uh, is have a prior distribution for the value of these parameters. So uh, one thing we have here is that you know b seems to be this line seems to be uh, intercepting the origin at uh, about zero, and so maybe we can say that the distribution of B is going to be something that is centered on zero, right? That's our prior um, distribution for B. Uh, the slope here seems to be seems to be positive, so we can maybe reasonably assume that the distribution of A uh, of A is going to be something that is. Uh, larger than zero, maybe maybe it's truncated, whatever, we don't really know. So these two things are the priors that uh, we have into our, um, into our model. One thing that is very interesting with, uh, with ABC is the way we're going to be using this, uh, these priors to come up with, uh, to, to come up with uh, estimates of the distribution of the, uh, of the parameters. So let's say we have, uh, let, let, let's write this problem in terms of, I'm pretty sure I can do it. Okay. Um, so, so the way we work in ABC is that we have our, uh, we have our priors here. So we have the, the one for B and the one for A. And we're going to be getting from this um, one sample. So we're going to be sampling one value from the distribution of A, one value from the distribution of B. This point, we are going to put it into um, our model. So we can this model, uh, can call this model F, for example. And what F will do uh, is that it will give us uh, a series of values. So it can be um, we're going to call that V. So the point of these values V is that they are uh, what we will call summary statistics. Um, and the summary statistics, they need to have the property that we can also measure them on 
uh, an empirical data set. So if you have your, uh, your Excel spreadsheets with your measurements of whatever, then you can also uh, put this empirical data set into another function that are going to give you another set of, uh, of summary statistics. So we have the one for the model and we have the one for the, uh, sorry, give me just a second. Sorry, uh, so we have the summary statistics for the simulation and we have the summary statistics for the uh, empirical data set. And the, the point of ABC is that we can, uh, we can take these two values and we can compare them. And the way we compare them is by uh, calculating the, uh, the distance between them. So the, the, the way we, uh, the, the, the reason for picking this distance is that if, um, we have a sample here that when we calculate the summary statistics give a small distance, then that, is, um, then that is going to be a good sample. But if it gives a, a large distance, then it is not going to be uh, a good sample. It is instead going to be a bad sample. So one of the way we do this, uh, this sampling, and it, it is one more parameter uh, here, which uh, we're going to call Let's call it maybe rho. Um, the final test is the distance, is it smaller or equal to uh, the distance rho? So the point is because we are uh, drawing samples from this distribution, so we're drawing multiple samples from here, multiple samples from here, and if they give summary statistics that are different from the summary statistics that we get from the model, we're going to be rejecting this. Um, we're going to be rejecting these samples, and this is what we call uh, rejection sampling. And when we do that uh, sufficiently many times, where sufficiently many times is not something that uh, is necessarily easy to um, to guess a priori, but it's something that we can can play with. So do we need a hundred samples in the posterior, doing like 1,000, uh, 10 millions, whatever. And we will end up with something that is, um, <clears throat> that should be a good posterior distribution for the, uh, for the parameter. So coming back to, uh, coming back to what would happen with the linear regression, for example, if we add X and Y, X and whatever points, over here. Uh, one first line we could draw would be, say, this one. You would have a high value of B and a low value of A. This one is probably, is probably not going to be a way uh, to get some summary statistics out of this line that would match really well with the empirical summary statistics. And so this sample is likely to be, uh, is very likely to be rejected. So this sample is most likely very bad. But if we draw uh, a bunch of other lines, now this one is obviously going to be really good. So we can say that we will most likely be uh, accepting the sample. One thing that is interesting is what happens when we have something like, uh, let's highlight this one, it's interesting. Um, something like this red line over here. So the decision of whether we will accept this red line over here, it's like, it's, it's, it's an okay line, but it's not really good. And so depending on the value, uh, the cutoff that we use to decide if whether we accept or whether we reject the sample, this line is going to be uh, excluded or included in, uh, in, the, um, in the posterior. So one, one thing that's going to be important in terms of uh, the total time we will spend um, running this algorithm is there is a relationship between uh, rho, which is the, tr the threshold for accepting and rejecting sample, and then uh, the total time we will spend calculating. So if rho is very, uh, it's very high, then we will not spend very many time at all because we're going to accept everything. 
but if rho gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the time will possibly increase a lot. So we have sort of a trade-off here between, uh, here it's short in terms of time, but it's also, uh, it's also bad in terms of feet. Here it can be very long, but it's also good in terms of fit. And so the question is, where do we want to move um, across this space? And how many times are we willing to expand doing the computation versus how good do we need the sample to, um, to be? Uh, so that sort of, that is a very, uh, the very basic introduction to, uh, to ABC. And at this point, you may be wondering what is Bayesian in that? Uh, and the thing that is Bayesian is, um, um, this can be re-expressed in terms of the base formula by making a few simplifying assumption and there's a few interesting properties uh, that, that's all explained in the PLOS computational biology paper. I'll, I'll put a link on the chat um, at, at some point during the, during the demo. Uh, and it, it, it's sort of uh, what happens when you simplify base formula to its essential components and when you make a bunch of simplifying assumption that shouldn't work but they work because that's the way data are organized, I guess. Uh, it's, 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 it's very intriguing to look at uh, how much simplification you can get away with when, you, uh, when you're dealing with, um, with a data set. Um, yeah, so let's move on to the, uh, the fun part. And the fun part is, uh, is the code. So, um, let me just okay so stop share and let me share my screen here yeah sure. okay good uh can you all see my screen here yes yeah okay yep. excellent so um I was going to say quick show of hands, but I can I can see your hands. Um, we're going to be using Julia. If you uh, if you're familiar with it, you may notice that I'm I'm writing code in in a way that is not necessarily very uh, idiomatic. If you're not familiar with it, you may find something weird. Uh, at any point, if you want to uh, discuss the, the the code, if you have any question, don't don't hesitate to jump in and uh, and interrupt me. Uh, and I'll be very happy to um, to explain that. Um, before we start, let me just show you. Um, let me just show you the sort of uh, the sort of things we are dealing with at the moment. Okay. So one thing that I, I like a lot with uh, with Julia is that. Uh, is that every project is very reproducible and you carry with your project all of the dependencies. So at the moment for this particular project, we're using the packages uh, distribution plot, stats base, stats plot, and statistics. Um, and this little number here is, um, it's a point in the Git tree of these packages. So that's identifying not only the version, but also where in the source of this package you will find uh, you will find this version. Uh, and then there's this file here, which is storing uh, all of the dependencies of all of your dependencies. So the entire tree of packages and their own dependency is here. So if you were to take this file, uh, use it on your computer and install the packages from here, you would get the exact same version uh, of all of these dependencies all these dependencies uh, that I, I am also using at the moment. So it's really good for reproducibility. Um, and I, I, I like that a lot um, uh, in the language. So what we are going to do is activate this environment. So I've done that before we started. Uh, and then adding the packages, stats plots for plots, statistics is for things like average standard deviation. Uh, stats based is for, it's probably for sampling. I'm not even sure I'm using it. Anyway, it's fine. And distribution is a very, very cool and very powerful package for statistical distribution that lets you do tons and tons of things. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very useful to, uh, in, in a lot of applications. Okay, so the problem we'd like to solve is um, 
is the following. You are a biologist and every year you go to an island. It's a very small island. It's like it only has one, it only has room for one shrub on it. And it's far away in the ocean. And in this island, on this island, on this shrub, there is an insect that can live here. And your question is, what is the rate of colonization? And what is the rate of extinction of this insect on this island? So you go to the island, you walk around the, the little shrub that's here, and you try to check for the presence of the insect. So the issue with that is the insect has the exact same color as the shrub. So sometimes you can miss it. If it's not here, um, you, you will not find it, but sometimes it will be here, but it's going to be well hidden and you will miss it. So the, the sort of model that you would like to use to describe the thing is on the one hand, you have the true state of the island, whether it is colonized or whether it is empty because the insect is here or not here. But the information you have in practice is your own measurement. So I have found or I have not found the insect. That's sort of a very classical way of, of describing uh, presence or absence of a species. And you could, you could look at this problem with, uh, with, with uh, like a hundred different tools. You don't need ABC for that, but it's sort of, um, I sort of like this example because you can estimate these parameters. So the parameters you would need to estimate are uh, what is the rate of extinction? So when the insect is present in one year, what is the probability that will be absent the next year? Uh, the rate of colonization, if the insect is absent, what is the probability that it will be back the next year? but also the rate of measurement. So if the insect is uh, present, what is the chance that you will miss it when you're doing new sampling? That is three parameters. And so you model as two uh, series of states, one that is a real state and one that's the wrong, uh, the measured state. Uh, so the way I've expressed that um, in the code is there is a function called island here. Uh, and that is our model. It is a model that is generating data that looks like the data you will, um, you will have. And it takes as input the rate of extinction, uh, E, the rate of colonization, C, uh, and the error you're making when you're doing the measurement, which is, uh, which is M. And we're going to simulate uh, observation on this island for, uh, for 200 years. So no one here is going to sample an island for 200 years, but we're going to do that. Uh, you'll see why um, in a minute. We do the usual uh, assertion. All of these parameters are going to be rates, are going to be probabilities. We're going to think the probabilities. So that they have to be between zero and one. That's fine. And then we're going to create two, uh, two arrays for observation. One that is a true state, the insect is here or not here and one that is a measured that I have detected or I have not detected this, uh, this insect. Um, and we're going to make the assumption that uh, the insect is initially absent uh, in the first year. It doesn't change much. It doesn't, doesn't change anything if you do uh, sufficiently many years of observation, but uh, uh, you, can, you can play around with that if you, uh, if you want. Uh, and then for every year, we're going to first update the true states of the island for the next year. So if the species is, um, if the species is initially absent, then we're going to, sorry, if, it, if it's initially present, we're going to check that it's not extinct. And if it's initially absent, we're going to check if it colonizes. And then the state that we measure for this year, uh, if the insect is here, then we're going to check that we have missed it or not. And if it's not here, then we'll not detect it. So that's not uh, something involving a test. And what we get at the end is uh, the measured steps. So we, at, at this point in this simulation model, we never know what the actual state of the island is. All we know is our measurement. So just to give you an idea, if we do, um, let's say we do this simulation where we have 10% uh, chance of going extinct, uh, 20% chance of, uh, of colonizing, but we do the wrong uh, observation about half the time. Then the series, the time series which we get is something like this, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, uh, for 200 uh, time step. And we can do it again, and then we would get a different time series. And we could possibly do that like a million times, 10 million times until, uh, 
until we're happy with the, uh, the answer. So the question is, what sort of information can we extract from this? Because we have a model that is generating data, so we could do simulations, but we need to translate that into something that we will compare with uh, the, the data that we collect on the field. So we're going to be using two summary statistics here, uh, and they're sort of very crude, but they work well enough, uh, and they have some sort of biological sense behind them. Uh, we are going to be counting the total number of transition. So a transition is how many times uh, the island is changing state in our measurements. So the insect was absent, and then the next year it is present, that is one transition. Uh, or the insect was present, and then we think it's absent the next year, that is one transition. And we could have n minus one possible transition, so we can transform that uh, into a value that goes from zero to one, uh, and something that would be oscillating like zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one all the time would have the maximum number uh, of transition. The second summary statistic we'll use is the uh, occupancy, and occupancy is how many times the insect was detected as being present. So uh, an insect that will be here all the time would have an, an occupancy of one, an insect that would never be detected would have an occupancy of zero. Um, one thing that is very important with, uh, with the summary statistics in, in ABC is that your estimation of the posterior distribution is only as good as the set of summary statistics that you're using. If you use too many, you have the usual risk of uh, the curse of dimensionality, and you're never going to be accepting samples. But if you use too few of them, you're going to miss some important structure in your data set. And so it's always worth experimenting with different summary statistics to see if you get a better, um, a better fit. Um, which means that it would be a good idea to rewrite this function summary so that it takes, for example, uh, an array of function instead of taking instead of having the function r coded here but let's go with that so if we do um, our simulation here we could pass it to um, to summary and then we know that for this value of parameters we've got about 40 percent of transition and we get an occupancy of about uh, 42 percent of the time if we do it again and again and again and again, then we get different, we get slightly different, slightly similar values for this, um, for the same, same set of parameter. So now what we have is a model that is simulating uh, the dynamics of the, of the observation. And we have a way, which is a summary function of converting these observations into something which we can compare to um, empirical data. So empirical data, let's say we have, uh, 20 years of observation. And we know that from the year four to 12, we have detected the insect on the island. Uh, years 14 and 15, we have detected the insect. And years 17 and to 20, we have detected the insect. Um, and so in a sense, we, we know that we know when the insect was detected and when the insect was, uh, was absent. So what we can do now is take uh, the summary of the please don't freeze, of the empirical data, and we know that in the empirical data set we have a uh, number of transition is uh, seventy five. So the occupancy is seventy five, and the uh, transition is point uh, point twenty six. So the thing we'll we'll need to do at this point is try many, many, many combination of, uh, of parameters for E, C, and M, and see which combination of parameters give time series that have the same sort of summary statistics. The one thing that is important here is that the empirical data set, which we have, have only 20 years, and the simulations that we generate have, uh, have 200. We have 2,000, we could have 2 million, it doesn't really matter, but the point is, uh, we can, uh, as long as we can, make the data set and the simulation speak the same language, which is a language of the summary statistics, then we can compare them. So in a, in a situation where we would not get access to the empirical data, we would only uh, get something like, here was the total occupancy, and here was the number of transition over 20 years, then we could still use this model in the context of ABC, because it does not require the empirical data, it requires actually the summary statistics that were derived 
uh, from the empirical data. Sort of an interesting twist if you have very complex models, sort of like individual based models, as long as you can summarize the result of a simulation in a number that you can also summarize uh, the empirical data sets with, then you can apply uh, ABC. Um, that's not really required. We're going to define a function for the Euclidean distance. Uh, so it's going to be the sum of the square root of the square of the differences between uh, occupancy and transition. We can do that because both occupancy and number of transition are defined between zero and one. Of course, you should uh, think very carefully about, um, about the sort of distances you're using. Um, and at this point, we need to think about priors that we will put into uh, our model. And that's when your uh, intuition as a biologist comes into play, right? And so we can say, for example, the rate of colonization, it's going to be about like 0.4. Uh, and, and the rate of colonization is something that uh, in, in island biogeography, you can estimate from uh, the distance between the island and, and the shore, for example. So it's like it's, it's far away, but not too far away. So we'll say 0.4 is going to be maybe between 0.2 and 0.8. Um, and that is the way we can, uh, you can define distributions using the uh, distribution.gl package. So we're taking a normal distribution for the rate of colonization, but we're also uh, truncating it. So it only has support between zero um, and one. Let's, do, let's draw something like a thousand variables uh, from this distribution and do an histogram, just to get a sense of what that looks like. Uh, so the first time you run any function in Julia, it takes a little while because it is compiling it, and then the second time is faster. So we're going to should be seeing an histogram in the next couple uh, seconds, usually. But of course, when you do something in front of an audience, it always takes longer and or crashes. Anyway, one is doing whatever it is that it's doing. Let's uh, let's have a look at the two other uh, priors. So we see the rate of extinction is 0.3. Uh, we run the we want the uh, the rate of extinction to be lower because that's a good way to know that our uh, our population is going to persist. Uh, and we also want it to be truncated between zero uh, and one. Andrew, you had a you had a question. Hi, yeah, I was just asking in the in the chat also, um, if it matters, like we could use a distribution that only has support between zero and one, and if it makes a difference in ABC, what uh, actual distribution the samples come from? No, you could, uh, you could, you could definitely use something that only has support between zero and one. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised you did not suggest that we use a better distribution much earlier than that, uh, Dr. McDonald. Uh, that would have been very on brand. But yes, we, you could use any sort of distribution that, that you want and, and you would pick your priors for ABC the exact way, the exact same way you would pick your priors for, uh, for any sort of vision uh, approach. So you could use, you could try with a uniform, or with a beta, you could try with uh, a log normal, or whatever seems appropriate to you uh, based on the, the mechanism which you're trying to, uh, to represent. Uh, so we have, we have a plot here. Let me, uh, let me move it down a little bit. So that is a histogram of values of the, the rate of colonization. So we're going to be looking at uh, things that go from uh, close to zero to maybe point, uh, point 0.8 ish um, here. Uh, and so the next one was the rate of extinction and then the rate of, um, of measurement error. So the rate of, of uh, how frequently we are missing an insect is, is something that we don't really that we don't really know. We think we're doing a good job, so it should be low. But because we think that the insect has the exact same color as the shrub, maybe it's much higher than we think. So we're going to give that a, a wider uh, standard deviation. So it's going to be giving this sort of uh, this sort of histogram shape where it's, it's sort of like close to zero, but it's very slowly decaying. Uh, up until it reaches, uh, it reaches one. Um, all right, so we are going to do not a million samples, that's absolutely not necessary. We go, we're going to do 10,000 samples. So if we do our 10,000 samples, uh, we, could, uh, we could 
consider that these are our prior samples. There's another way. Uh, I'll show you another way immediately, uh, immediately after if we have some time. And what we're going to do with our prior for C, E, and M is we are going to feed them into a model which is called uh, island. So that's going to be taking um, not, not very many time at all. Uh, and that, that's of course something that is obviously easy to, uh, to run in a, in a parallel way, right? You can do like thread parallelism, you can do PMAP if you want. Every simulation is independent, so you can distribute that as much as you want. And if you're doing more uh, intensive uh, sampling in, in ABC, then it, 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 there's a huge payoff in, in writing code that is uh, parallel. So our, our time series here uh, for every input, so for every combination, uh, C, E, and M is, uh, is a simulation. So the next thing we want to do is, uh, is get a sense of what are the, uh, the distances between this. So we're going to take the empirical data and summarize them. Uh, we're going to take every time series and summarize it as well and calculate the distance between them. Uh, that is also relatively fast and we can do an histogram of the distances. So every, uh, every point that went into this is one sample from the distribution of C, E, and M. And we have some, we have some points that have a very poor fit, so distance is close to one. Uh, we have a lot of points that fit like okay, but not terribly good. So the, the median of this thing is about like 0.5 maybe. Um, and so the question is what value of the distance constitutes a good sample? So if we take something like 0.25, we're going to be taking maybe one fourth of the sample. If we take a distance of 0.1, we're going to be taking maybe one ten. If we take something like 0 0.01, we're going to take one out of every 1,000 samples. And so the question is, do we want samples that are good, but it's going to take a while to get them? Or do we want samples that are okay, but it's going to get um, to, to be faster? Another thing is that if the distance is too small, you are actually overfitting your problem significantly, and it's 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 okay to give some uh, to give some leeway in terms of how good a sample must be for it to be uh, accepted. Um, so when we have that, and we're not we're not necessarily doing uh, rejection sampling here, we're doing sort of like keeping sampling where we generate all of the samples and we only keep the ones that are appropriate. There's, a, there's an example with rejection sampling immediately after that. Uh, we could use the find all function to get the position of everything that is uh, that, that must be kept because its distance is under, uh, we use point 0.1 here. So the index of the uh, samples that have been retained to be part of the posterior distribution are 37, 41, 123, 132, uh, so on and so forth. And so what we can do here is generate um, the distribution for the posterior distribution for the value of C of E and M. So let's look at the density of, um, of the priors for E. So that was the thing that we, uh, we put into our model. There was this nice uh, normal distribution centered on 0.3, I guess. And if we overlay on top of that, uh, the posterior distribution for E, then we, we, what we see that our uh, intuition about the rate of extinction was actually overestimating uh, quite significantly the rate uh, of extinction. So if we're trying to feed this data set using occupancy and using the number of transitions, um, then, then it seems like the uh, average value of the rate of extinction would be the mean of posterior of E, which is about uh, 1.48. Uh, let's look at the other values. So we can do the same thing for the priors, posteriors for the rate of colonization. Again, a nice normal distribution. And we had a little bit underestimated maybe uh, the rate of colonization. So instead of being 0.4, it's maybe 0.45, 0.6. I can't remember what it was exactly. Uh, and finally, let's see how good of a biologist you are. And let's compare the rate of uh, measurement error. Okay. So a prior distribution was a blue line here. 
So it can, can go from zero uh, up until one, but if we look at one of the most likely values given uh, the tolerance here that we have, that's probably that the actual rate of uh, missing an insect is close to point, uh, point 0.1. Let's see what it is. It's point oh 0.07. So you only have a 7% chance of missing an insect uh, plus or minus 0.04 when it is actually in, um, in the island. Now, the interesting thing here. Um, is that we have created uh, a sampling with a sample of posterior, uh, the posterior distribution for all three parameters. And for example, what we may want to do um, is use that to generate some data. But the data we were generating so far were only data about the measurement. And we may want to be, we want to, to think about the actual distribution of, um, of insects on this island. So let's let's write a function called the actual island. And the actual island, it only takes two parameters, which are the rates of uh, extinction and rate of colonization. Because we're not making any mistake here. Uh, and there is no measured state, so no true state. And there is no measured state, and we get the true state. I'll get it, true. And so what we can do with this function now is that we can uh, call actual island and we can uh, call it with, uh, with value from the posterior distribution of E and, uh, and, and C, let's see. And this is going to give us uh, the actual time series actual simulated time series for the presence and the absence of the insect um, in the island. So that's, it's a nice little, um, I think that ABC is a nice little technique when you, uh, when you have a model for which we, you don't know how to express the likelihood and you want to still estimate the distribution of the parameters. You want to summarize your model using different tools. Uh, and that provides estimates of parameters that are really, um, really good. There's a few interesting discussion about why sometimes using ABC instead of non-approximating techniques give better fit. Uh, and not really surprisingly, that is because of the, uh, the measurement error. So whenever you, you, you're measuring something, there is a small uncertainty around that. And so if you put some stochasticity back into the model, it's in sort of a counterintuitive way, it will give you better prediction um, if you assume that everything is purely um, deterministic. Um, we can do the we can do the same thing using uh, an actual rejection scheme. So let's say we want to do two thousand samples. Uh, so we pre-allocate two thousand samples. At the beginning, we have made zero trials, uh, got zero successes, and as long as we don't have the number of uh, required samples that succeeded, we're going to try and generate samples. So well, let's do that. Let me just show some uh, show some more screen. So using a using a value of uh, of row, so the, the the cutoff to decide if we keep a sample or not of 0 0.08, then we get a rate of rejection which is 99%. If you use something that was um, if you use something that was uh, I think point 15, we would get about half, uh, like 50% rejection rate. So it's, it's interesting to do a few trials at the beginning with different values of, uh, of the cutoff and see, try to estimate based on the number of parameters uh, that you want, how many, um, how many iteration you will need to do until you get a sample of the correct, uh, of the correct size. Um, that's going to give the same sort of value as we had before, the same, um, the exact same results, but this version is the actual uh, rejection sampling, as opposed to the one that we had before. We simulated all of the things before on only kept the one that you um, that you wanted. Um, I think that that covers sort of the, the very basics of um, of ABC. Uh, I think in the 
Zoom invitation email, which you uh, all received. There was a link to an online version of, uh, of that with some, some text and some more uh, explanations. Uh, but I think if you, uh, if you have questions, uh, I'd be happy to try and answer them as much as I can. Oh, there are a few questions in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, Michael is asking, would it make sense to weight the samples according to inverse dis distance rather than do rejection? Uh, yes, ish. Yes, uh, I, I mean, I hope it makes sense because I've done that once or twice. Uh, it's a good idea when you do, for example, uh, averages of your posterior distribution in the end, then you, you should be using the sample uh, distance to the empirical data. Um, but uh, it, one thing that you can do, uh, I'm, Michael, I'm guessing the question is if you, if you have samples that are really bad, but were still accepted, would you, why would you give them the same weight as a sample that is good, but was also accepted? Uh, one thing you could do is do ABC twice. So you could do a first ABC version uh, based on priors that you, you think are somewhat informative, but not necessarily really good. And then you look at the posteriors for that and to use a threshold that is quite, uh, that's, that's very generous and you keep a lot of bad samples. And then you look at the posteriors the first step, use them as prior for the next step and you use a, um, a cutoff that is uh, a bit more conservative. So you only get good samples. So you could, you could sort of nest the ABC um, inside, inside itself to, uh, to make sure that you converge into something that makes, uh, that makes sense. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, what if two parameters are correlated? Question from Scott. Uh, they are they're likely to be, uh, but that's where you should be doing the same sort of uh, diagnostics that you do for any sort of Bayesian uh, model. Uh, uh, and, and it's not only the distribution of one parameter that is important, the joint distribution of all, uh, of all parameters. So if you get, if you do your, um, your posterior distribution in which you have like a, um, a thousand points for every parameter, so you would not take the first value of C with like the tenth value of M. You would take the first value of C with the first value of M and the first value of E. Uh, just, just to make sure that you are respecting the, uh, the correlation uh, or, or the covariance that are uh, in these parameters. But I'm quite sure, I, I'm far from being uh, any good at uh, classical Bayesian things, but I'm sure that's a, uh, an issue that has been discussed by Bayesian statistician as well. Okay, well, if there's no more, uh, no more question. Ah, oh, there is. Yeah, Philip in the, in the chat is, uh, is uh, as a follow-up on, um, on, on, on uh, Michael's question. There are also correction methods based on local linear regression that try to model where the parameter should be at zero distance between, uh, between summary statistics. Uh, you can, as always, you can be, uh, you can be as fancy as you want. But one of the things that is surprising with ABC is that you don't need to be, you don't need to be that fancy for it to work. You can make a lot of simplifying assumptions that look somewhat outrageous on paper, uh, but but they actually work. So it's not, um, so it's not necessarily a bad uh, a bad idea. It, it 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 pays a lot to be very uh very empirical with this sort of tools so you just like experiments you tweak the value of the parameters you do a lot of uh visualization you do a lot of diagnosis in the end uh and it's it, it's somewhat ad hoc but you will find combination and approaches that um that work but usually when you do the like the very broad strokes abc with no uh no sort of refinements it, it gives you an answer that is it's good enough most of the time. A uh, question from, uh, from Valentin. Uh, the choice of summary statistics is crucial. Any tips and advice on how to choose invents one? Uh, not really. Uh, just, 
there's no it's it's definitely uh my, my answer would be try to think about what would be a good diagnosis diagnostic for whether your model is uh is working uh and, and maybe maybe they can tell you if you have too many uh or too few or not the right summary statistics one, one thing that is recommended but it's not really actionable is that the summary statistics should be capturing most of the variance in your uh in your simulated or empirical data but that's not something that you can necessarily um, easily measure. Uh, maybe someone who's an actual statistician might might disagree with that. Um, but I, I I think it helps to think of these issues in in terms of the like the biology or the domain knowledge uh, for which you're trying to apply uh, ABC. Uh, what are the things that are important, right? So if you, if you think back about this, this example of uh, an insect on an island, uh, the fact that the insect was present in 1996 is maybe not terribly informative. It's maybe not as informative as uh, what is the longest stretch of years in which the insect was absent, or what is the longest stretch of years in which the insect was, was present, something like that. That might be a good summary statistics to add. Uh, so if you if you find that the insect is never present more than two years in a row, maybe that's informative. Um, and then if you if you find uh, stretches of twenty years with where you don't observe the insect, then maybe that is also biologically informative. So try to uh, frame the issue of summary statistics not necessarily as a statistical problem, but as a, as a domain problem. Uh, Killian is asking what kind of ecological project the data set would you select Bayesian methods over frequency statistical methods? Oh man, um, I'm not going to comment on that uh, in, in public. Uh, all of them. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's, it's sort of a tricky, it, it depends. Uh, it, it depends on what you want to do. It depends on, on who you're working with. Uh, there's no yeah, there's no, there's no good answer. I, I, I could only give a bad answer to this question. I'm sorry. But if I, if I can um, flip this question inside a little bit, the, the sort of project for which I would use ABC is uh, things that involve um, a complex modeling and also empirical data sets. So that, that's one instance in which ABC is, is a clear uh, a, a clear choice of, of a vision technique, of a somewhat vision technique for, um, for analysis. Uh, Ivan is asking, is it possible to weight differently the summary metrics? Yes, you could, uh, you could play around with a uh, distant function you're using. We use Euclidean distance, but you could, use, um, you could use the weighted distance. You could use all the sort of distances. Uh, all, all that matters is that in the end, you need to come up with a single value when you compare this value to uh, a threshold. If it's under the threshold, then you keep the sample. If it's above the threshold, then you, um, then you reject it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a good idea to check this, uh, this link in the, in the chat. Uh, Lander uh, shared something about the sufficiency of summary statistics. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a deep rabbit hole of statistical literature. Um, that is, that is uh, a little, I always found it a little bit opaque, but it's, it's a lot of good advice uh, on how you can try and pick summary statistics that captures enough information. Um, Uh, so Matthew is asking, you observe effect of using different distances, L1 distance versus Euclidean. Uh, sure, yes. All, I mean, all, all the time, if you, uh, anytime you, you, the worst, the worst type of problems in ecology are the one where you need to pick a distance measure because uh, it's, it's going to have a huge impact on the results. But then again, that is sort of, uh, that's a variable in the model almost. You could, you could try different distance measures and see if you, uh, if you get the same posterior distribution, see if you get things that are, outlandishly different, so maybe that's an, an, uh, an indication that the distance measure is, uh, is very important.
So this question from Melanie uh, is what, what exactly we're trying to do with the um, island insect uh, insect data. So uh, one, of, one of the, uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, one of the situation in which ABC is really useful is when you are, uh, and I think Philippe was commenting on that in the, in the Slack as well, uh, in the chat as well, uh, is when you, you're trying to uh, get a sense of something that has a lot of hidden mechanisms, of things that you don't necessarily quite observe. Uh, and so one of the applications here of, of ABC would be that we can, we can quantify the uncertainty that is associated with the measurement. And so if you want to do a simulation of the presence of the insect on the island, what you want to get is the actual value of colonization and extinction. And so if you use ABC to, to fit all these parameters as well as the measurement um, uncertainty, then you can feed the parameters for colonization and extinction back into the model and you would do your ecological inference based on these, uh, based on these values. Uh, is asking how many parameters can you hope to estimate with ABC, uh, depending on the amount of data and the summary statistics. So the amount of data, surprisingly, um, is, is not necessarily limiting because you are summarizing things. So if you have an entire data set, if you have like a, an agent-based modeling with a million agents, and you, you track that into an array of 10 values, then what you have in the end are, are 10 values. But uh, when, when you're doing this, um, this sort of inference approaches, as, as usual, you have uh, the, the curse of dimensionality. So the more summary statistics you have, the more likely to, the, the more difficult it will be to find a sample that matches all of them at the same time. Um, and I, I, I have not seen, uh, at, at least for the eco evo papers I've read, I've not seen a good role of thumb for how many parameters there should, uh, there should be. The more parameters you have, the more difficult it will be. But if you have something like, I've applied to a problem with four, five, six parameters, uh, and it worked, uh, it worked okay. I'm guessing if you have like 25 parameters, then maybe that's not what you want to do. Maybe you want to reframe your problem slightly, but if you have, uh, yeah, literally a handful of parameters, so like five plus or minus one, that should be, that should be fine. Uh, Martin is asking, do you see any big advantages at this point in using Julia rather than R for ABC? Is it much faster? Uh, it's, it's, it's just personal preference. I think that uh, Julia is extremely good for uh, all scientific application. That's what it was, it was meant for. Uh, it's it's easy to parallelize. It's uh, it has a, a really good ecosystem of uh, of packages and and tools. Uh, and I've never I've not tried to do ABC uh, in R. I have a few students that uh, that try to do ABC in R in, uh, in in one of my classes, and it went it went well. I don't know if it is much faster. Uh, I I just know that my code. My ABC code in Julia is going to be much faster than my ABC code in R, just because I've been more um, exposed to this language in the last five, uh, five years. Uh, and Mikhail is asking, are the specific packages for ABC, or is this something one typically implements themselves? I, I've never looked for an ABC package. I know there's one in R. Uh, the, there must be one in Julia, but the, the code is not, if, if you do, um, if you do things that are simple, the code is not difficult to write and you have a lot of flexibility when you're writing your own code. Uh, and if you do something that is a bit more complicated, then it, it, it's likely that you will need to uh, build some of the pieces yourself. Uh, and so uh, the, the version of ABC that I've written in, in Julia and, uh, and C, I've written myself and it, it always comes down to being under 100 lines. So you can use the, the building blocks of like distributions, uh, the random sampling, all of that. But the actual ABC routine, it's, uh, it's, just, a, it's just a giant while loop and a distance measure. Um, yeah, a bunch of questions. I'm just trying to scroll back and forth. Uh, that, that, that. 
Yeah, Kellner, Kellner and Hubble, uh, 2017, uh, as, as some may be seen are, there are a few, thank you, uh, thank you, Courtney, there's a few, uh, there's definitely a few. If, if you look for uh, ABC in R, you will find a few blog posts uh, and a few paper that, that do it, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that is computationally intensive on the, because uh, you, need, you, need uh, you need the model to generate the data and you need to do it a bunch of times. But it's usually something that is, is parallelized, um, and and it, it's there's not going to be one language that is a clear winner in terms of uh, of speed. Uh, Matthew is asking, we've been trying some of the probabilistic programming languages for uh, ecological modeling. Yes, we have tried uh, we've tried Turing recently, uh, and we we have tried we have uh, yeah we have this this one project where we use Turing and Stan. Uh, we ended up using Stan in the version that uh, made it to the paper because it had more support for statistical distribution. Uh, it was easier to specify them, but I've been uh, running a few side projects with Turing and I'm, I'm impressed by uh, the flexibility and the, uh, and, and the speed of, uh, of this language. Okay, everyone, uh, it was fun, at least I had fun. I hope you had fun too. Um, and I need to go back to parenting at this point. Um, so stay safe, stay home, wash your hands, and uh, you can always ping me on Twitter if you have any uh, any questions. Bye, everyone. <laughs>